Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equate Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Today, my very special guest is Brian Stavely. Brian shares his research into the Mandela Effect and how the phenomenon is not a simple case of misremembering, but a very real and personal experience for many people. And so without further ado, here's Brian. Well, friends, we have a great show, and uh, Brian Stavely's with us. Brian, your channel is uh, The Real News Online, is that correct? Um, that's actually my backup. My my main channel is the same as my name, so it's youtube.com slash user Brian S. Stavely. And then when they ban me, I'm on my backup. And then I have a third channel, which <laughs> we can leave in the link of the show description or something, because that's where I'm broadcasting live right now for 90 days. So All right. We'll get into the banning piece of it. Uh, we'll talk about that also because I know a little something about that. And I just wanted to say I love your work. I put a lot of your your content up on my blog every day. Um, and this is really, Brian, the first show that I'm dedicating to the Mandela Effect. I've, I've spoken about it before with other guests, but we didn't major on it. It was basically part of an overall discussion. So, so – and um, – I'm very impressed with the work that you do. It's very diligent. It's very detail oriented, and I can relate to a lot of the uh, the Mandela effect examples that you present to your audience. And maybe also, if we have time, we'll get into a little bit of the uh, of, of the flat Earth, and uh, we'll talk about that a bit. So, with that, um, since you're a first time guest, what I would love for you to do is just to take our audience through your path in life, your journey. How did you end up doing the work that you're doing today? Um, well, I could actually, you know, everybody's awakening is, is a process, but there's always like key pivotal points, you know, for me, I could really nail down the pivotal point for me is I literally stumbled across a movie called World Trade Center on Netflix in 2010. And although it was a propaganda piece, had a movie with Nicolas Cage in it, I don't know if you've ever seen that. But it was it was a propaganda piece to push forward, you know, uh, certain aspects of the 9-11 tales. And while it was di it, but it was different enough from the mainstream narrative that uh, th something clicked in my head where I was like, wow, you know, it didn't really have the intended effect on me. It actually made me go look deeper into it. And then I just started researching 9/11. And you know, that's a whole other story for another day. But where that took me, you know, through all of that, uh, it was it was a long journey through a lot, a lot of research, a lot of interviews and stuff like that. And that led me into looking at the moon landing. Yeah. 2012. I knew the moon landing was fake in 2012. Did a couple shows on that, and then that brought me to satellites and the ISS in 2013, and then start questioning the, the shape of the Earth in 2014. And around late 2014, a little bit after looking into flat Earth, uh, obviously when you look into flat Earth, just like when you look into 9/11, um, you know, different people have their favorite topics, but obviously those two topics are huge. I don't think anybody could disagree with that. Then there's a lot of research to be done. And, um, you know, and so the first few months of looking at the flat earth, I was just about that 24 seven, you know, and then one day somebody sent me a, a post, a friend of mine about the Berenstein bears yeah. and the Berenstein bears are now called the Berenstein bears. And I was like, oh, well, that's, you know, really crazy. And, you know, when you first see a Mandela effect, you don't understand what you're even looking at. You're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. It's the Berenstein bears. And then I was I looked into what people were saying, and they were saying, "Oh, people, these people think that they're from a parallel universe because they misremember something." And I'm just I kind of being through flat Earth and being through 9/11. You kind of know what disinformation pieces look like when you see them pop up from these types of websites, and they pop up in your Facebook timeline. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just like, there's probably a lot more to this than that. They're, they're trying to make these people look like complete idiots. And then I start to read some of the examples. And, you know, then I find out about, you know, and then I, I just to go back a little bit on the Berenstein Bears, I used to have the books. Um, I don't know how old you are, Mike, but, you know, I'm 41. And when I went to school, it was a thing to get like a book order. Every few months, you would get a bunch of books from the school. And I would have the Berenstein Bears books. And it was S-T-E-I-N. And I'm 100% sure about it. Now, the thing with the Mandela effect is people automatically say, okay, well, things can be rebranded. Companies can change their names. They can change characters. But the point that you're missing is you can go back 40 years ago, 30 years ago and pull those books out of your grandmother's attic, and those books are going to say Stain, S-T-A-I-N now. So it's not an online thing. It's not a digital download thing. It's it's physical things 
in your possession. And we're going to explain that more. But, you know, from the Berenstein, I think, you know, a lot of people's first two were that in JFK. So JFK was huge for me. That one hit me hard. Um, you know, I remember JFK and I remember there being four people in the car. That's right. You know, and I was never a huge JFK researcher, but I was deep enough into 9-11 and all these other terror events. And you, you're going to look at assassinations, even if you're not deep into JFK. I mean, I, I knew enough about it. I'd done enough research on it. Where to me, there were four people in the car. And then the crazy part is when I started to research into that one, the residue I found was amazing because – if you go and look, the 19, you know, people will say, oh, you're just misremembering. It was always six. So first you can look at parodies. You know, with the Mandela effect, things will change the official version, but parodies will remain. So if a TV show does the JFK assassination, like a skit on The Simpsons or Family Guy, whatever, it's four seaters. And there have been these episodes, four seats, four people in the limo. And then, you know, this, this is where it gets good, though. The Secret Service did a reenactment through the streets of Dallas to do the whole motorcade to study the crime and study for ballistics and whatever else. They need to be accurate. They used a four-seater. And I tell people this, and you know what they say to me? Oh, they just say, well, Lincoln wouldn't make the government another six-seater. And it's like, that's really what you're going to say? Like, first of all, they wouldn't really have a choice. But second of all, that, that, that's like you know how NASA won't put a camera on the moon and give you a live feed of the earth. They wouldn't have to pay for it. It would be the best thing ever. Advertisement would pay for it. Given the go the government another six-seater for them to parade through the streets in a reenactment of JFK's death would be the best free advertisement ever for your car company. Right. Why would they not do that? That's that's the most lame excuse. And this re reenactment was done like three, four, five years later. They had plenty of time to make another car. It's not like they did a reenactment next Friday. Hey, press us out a car in a week. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's um, the whole thing with uh, the Baron uh, Steen Bears. I can relate to Brian. Now I have 20 years on you. I'm 60 years old, but my daughter was really into the books when she was younger. And um, going back a couple of years ago, I was talking to my daughter and I said, Hey, do you remember those books that you used to read? The Baron, you know, I did this intentionally. Yeah, of course. And she said, The Baron Steen Bears. I said, Yeah, I. I said, now it's the Baron Stain Bears. And she says, get out of here, Dad. So she went and looked it up, and it blew her mind. And she did what many of us do when we come across this Mandela effect is we start looking and looking and looking, trying to validate what it is that we remember. Yeah. Right? And then you come up empty. So I mean, before the show... I mentioned to you that going back about four or five years ago, before the whole Mandela effect really got traction and a lot of people were talking about it, the way I became aware of it was a good friend of mine and a fellow researcher, Jack Hart, sent me a link, I guess, like I said, four or five years ago. And all he said in the email to me was, Mike, take a look at this link and read it. So I opened it up, I'm reading it, and it talked about, Three people that they say other people remember dying and most people do not. So the first one they brought up was Kirk Douglas. So I'm reading this and it's explained that some people remember Kirk Douglas dying, uh, but he's alive and well. That one struck a chord with me because I remember very distinctly back in the 1990s watching on television the service that was taking place in L.A. And Michael Douglas coming out of the service, and he was crying uncontrollably. And some of the commenters even commented on the fact that Michael Douglas was very broken up about his father's passing. And I thought to myself, this is crazy. So I went, I took a look on the internet, expecting to just close it out. You know, Kirk Douglas died. It's, it's been a long time now. No. All the articles on the internet were talking about the fact that Kirk Douglas was still alive at that time. He was in his mid to later 90s, and he was blogging in L.A. That was the storyline that they were giving. The other one that really struck a chord with me was Helen Thomas. I remember Helen Thomas, who was the lead White House correspondent going back years ago, many years ago. And um, I remember reading, it was either the New York Post or the New York Daily News, because I was in New York at the time, 
reading about her death. And she was on the front page, and as she would be, because she was a lead White House correspondent, right? As a journalist, she would be on the front page of a newspaper. And then the article that Jack sent me, she was the second example where it claimed that some people remember her dying, but, you know, she's alive and well. Well, I definitely remember Helen Thomas dying way back when because I remember reading the newspaper article. And the last one was Richard Chamberlain. And uh, I remember Richard Chamberlain dying. And of course, the same story with him that, you know, now in this reality, uh, he's not dead. So the reason why I want to bring that up is because I had my own Mandela experience going back four or five years ago before it was really popular to talk about, you know, and it was a, it was mind boggling to me, um, almost to the point where it was disturbing, especially the, uh, the Kirk Douglas piece, because I remember that very clearly. And fortunately, I have a brother, one of my brothers, we were talking about this and he remembers Kirk Douglas passing away too. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. brought it up to him. Did he take the update and say, Oh, I must've been wrong. Or did no. you stop and say, Whoa, this is crazy. No, no, no. When, when I, I talked to him about it and I sent him the link as well. He said to me, Mike, I remember watching that too. He died. So it wasn't one of those things where, you know, he shifted gears and said, well, maybe I misremembered it. That didn't happen. So there are Good. those people that will just stay very firm and say, no, that's what I remember. And then there are those that will question what they remember, right? They'll say they misremembered. And then yep. there's the third category, which is none of this that we're talking about means anything because nobody died. Whoever's alive is alive, right? Well, that, here's the thing with those people is, you know, and I can relate this kind of to other topics is, okay, there's people that will say, you'll show them the proof of the Mandela effect. You'll even pull something off the shelf and show them that it's changed even after they admitted, no, it's never been what you're saying. Okay, pull it off the shelf and you show them. But then they'll still have to deny it because it doesn't fit within their rules of reality. But their rules of reality are given to them by the same people that gave them all these other lies that we right. research. So you, right. you, we don't understand what reality is yet, but we can prove that this is happening. And now I have different theories in which we'll get into later on, on, on how, but I believe this has gone back maybe to the beginning of time. It's increasing and increasing, I feel, as our consciousness is awakening and the fact that we have the tools to spread the information and communicate with each other. But it's not because we have the internet that has caused the Mandela effect. The Mandela effect is happening and I don't believe it's any type of man-made or science thing, but we can – we'll get more into that later. But you know, one of the one of the other things too is I feel this affects everybody because this next one I want to talk about is, uh, is so huge. And the thing about this is everybody knows this one. So I do polls sometimes on Facebook where I'll ask people, you know, what they remember or whatever. And what I'll purposely do is I won't put these polls in Mandela Effect groups so they don't get skewed. I'll just leave them on my wall. And I'll let people – and everybody knows that Ed McMahon worked for Publishers Clearinghouse. Yes. Everybody knows. Now, here's the thing. You might say, oh, people – it's just a movie line that changed. It's this and that. But when I ask anybody, everybody not only remembers that Ed McMahon worked for Publishers Clearinghouse. They remember him going to the winner's doors, whether it's staged or not. But that's what they did for the commercials, going to the winner's doors to surprise them with a giant, huge, giant Publishers Clearinghouse check. And balloons all the time. Now, I'm not crazy. I'm not misremembering. And for me, it's so big because I'm from Lowell, Massachusetts. Ed McMahon is from Lowell, Massachusetts. He's from my hometown. Everybody here knows he worked for Publishers Clearinghouse. And you know who else knows? Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson was, you know, he, he did The Tonight Show as his, his sidekick for 30 years. Okay? Right. There's a, that I, a, a clip that I play. Um, what, now, what residue – I'll just explain residue real quick to the audience. Residue is leftover evidence backing what we remember. Now, I don't need any evidence to tell me that Ed McMahon worked for Publishers Clearinghouse. They can tell me he never did, and if there's really no footage of it, which there isn't, then something crazy is going on. I don't need it. I know. Like I trust my senses enough. That's the thing with the Mandela effect. It's like anything else. Like You go outside. You don't feel the earth spinning. You tell people, trust your senses. You know? Trust your memory. Now, our memory is not infallible, but it's not what they make it out to be. Like this is huge for me. Ed McMahon definitely worked for Publishers Clearinghouse. So to get to Johnny Carson, there's a clip 
that I play in the intro to my show every time. Johnny Carson comes out on the David Letterman show, okay? And he's joking around with David, and he's like, David, I'm sorry. Ed couldn't be here right now. And he pulls out a giant check, and he tells Dave he's the lucky winner. The check says publishes clearinghouse right on the check. And then people will tell me that I'm still misremembering. Well, it's Johnny doesn't know where his sidekick works uh, besides on The Tonight Show. And then there's clips in The Golden Girls where one of them answers the phone. And she's like, what's that? I've won Publishers Clearinghouse. Ed McMahon wants to see me right away. And then this goes – I could – just on Ed McMahon, I could go on and on because there's so many – different shows where this is done. Oh, Ed McMahon, there's even shows where Ed McMahon guest stars on and he comes to the door. He doesn't say specifically publishes Clarinos, but now they'll tell us, no, you're just misremembering. And it was always American fa family publishing with Dick Clark, which dude, Dick Clark was a huge star, just like Ed McMahon, even bigger. We would remember them working together. Yep. And it wasn't just for a year. He publishes Clarinos for decades. I had mail that came – envelopes that came in the mail with his face and the publisher's clearinghouse logo outline of a house on the envelope all the time. Yeah, exactly. I remember publisher's clearinghouse getting the envelopes and, you know, and, and putting the stamps or something in order to, to enter into the sweepstakes. And the commercials were all over the place. It wasn't one commercial here or another commercial there. They did a lot of commercials with Ed showing up at people's doors with big checks from Publishers Clearinghouse, you know? So in fact, you did a video on that. I think that's what you're referring to. And yeah. I, I put that up on my blog because uh, I clearly remember it. And then I put it up on my Facebook page and uh, a ton of my friends came back and said, no, he worked for Publishers Clearinghouse. They remember the, the commercials as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course. of course. And it's, 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 it's just, it's crazy that people will say it's bad memory. And, and, you know, there's so many of these that are huge, and then some of them, like if people would pay attention when we tell them about the Mandela effect, they would see things incrementally change. Like, for instance, The Wizard of Oz. Now, this is a huge one for me. Now, whether, you know, you admit it or not, everybody likes The Wizard of Oz. Everybody's seen it, okay? Everybody, everybody's seen The Wizard of Oz many times. I'll go out on a limb and say that. I think everybody listened yeah. to this. Yeah. Wizard of Oz. It's a huge movie, okay? One of the biggest movies ever, you'd have to say. So, in The Wizard of Oz now, you know, you know when, when she says, uh, fly my pretties fly, now she just says, fly, fly, fly. There's no fly my pretties fly. Now, you can find residue of this everywhere. This was huge, like on The Simpsons, and I keep bringing up The Simpsons, which I'll explain after, because The Simpsons is a gold mine of residue for the Mandela effect, as is shows like Saturday Night Live, Mad TV, The Big Bang Theory, shows where they do lots of spoofs and parodies. They always do things like how we remember. Now, if people want to say you're just remembering about this and that, misremembering, how are so many people misremembering the same thing, but not only misremembering the same thing, they're misremembering exactly the same word for word, scene for scene, lyric for lyric event for event, down to the most intricate detail, how will we all misremember in the same thing as each other? Right. It's absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. Um, and then in Wizard of Oz, to go further, now the Scarecrow has a gun. He's packing heat. And the crazy thing about this is I was explaining this to a friend of mine who's new to the Mandela Effect, like a lot of people watching or listening to this might be when they first see this. And he was like, he was like, BS, you're telling me if we put in The Wizard of Oz right now, the Scarecrow is going to have a gun. I said, yeah, bro. He's like, I think I have the movie. I said, bro, if you got the movie, you got to dig it out right now. And we got to watch it. And he got it out. He's had it for, I forget how many years. He said six, seven, eight years, however long he's had it for his kid. All right. We put it in. Scarecrow's got the gun. And then we watched the movie for other changes. And I show him the fly of my pretty fly. And at that point, that was the only two I knew of. And we scrutinized the movie. Six months later, the movie changed again. So not only can this not be a digital download issue because your movie's changing, but as you're watching these changes, your movie changes again a second time. And now if you watch The Wizard of Oz, the, the Tin Man, who's always had that big axe and an oil can, he now has a wrench about yay big. It's, <laughs> as, it's as big as his axe, dude. 
a big giant plumber's wrench. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's absolutely- well, he had an axe for sure. He had an axe. <laughs> yeah, and he still he still has the axe. And in the other hand, he's got a he's got a plumber's wrench. He doesn't have it for the whole movie, but he has it long enough where it's just absolutely ridiculous. It's it's crazy. And then there's other ones like um, the Thinker statue. Are you familiar with that one? Yes. Yep. That's a huge one for a lot of people. And this one is very crazy because you know the Thinker statue. For those that don't know what it is. Uh, and I've always mispronounced his name, Rodan, Rodin. So the Thinker statue is known for me, had the fist to the forehead. Yes. This this is very popular pose, Mike, because this is even used in like bodybuilding and stuff. It's become a bodybuilding pose where they go I think down. Arnold Schwarzenegger did it. I have a picture of him doing it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I do. I do. And um, I don't know if you add pictures to these after. If you want to add anything, just let me know. But I know that's that's a lot of work. But Arnold has one where he's he's doing it, right? And then there's a clip of Will Ferrell on Saturday Night Live, okay? And he's posing for an art class. And he it, you know, it's a joke and whatnot. And he says to them, I have two poses. And he's like, you know how they pose naked for art sculptures and stuff? So he's like behind like this piece of cardboard. Everybody's over there. They're going to draw him or whatever. And he's like, I got two poses. And he goes into it. And he goes, the thinker or the stinker. <laughs> and he like puts his butt out in the air or some, you know, some stuff. And it's like, dude, he's doing exactly what we remember. So why would shows like this do parodies of something and completely goof it up? But then on top of that, there's people that have gone to the thinker statue, and this pictures of them in front of the statue like this, and the statue in their picture has now changed, and it's like this. And it's like, who's going to actually travel there, pose in front of it wrong? <laughs> and then on top of it, there's more pictures that have come out now. I have a picture with like a field trip of like 100 kids. They're all around the statue, and they're all like this, and the statue yeah. like this. It's crazy. Oh, it is crazy. Now, the other thing, too, is I remember Nelson Mandela dying in jail. That I remember as well. Um, yep. So, and I think there are a lot of people that do remember that because when I do talk to people about the Mandela effect, they will remember him dying, passing away in jail. But uh, evidently, uh, you know, we don't remember it correctly, right? He got out of jail and then he, he died, you know, many years afterwards. It's crazy. So, the other the one I remember, um, Brian, let's see if you remember this one. And I did put it up on my Facebook page when it happened, and I, I got like a 50-50 response, people remembering it the way I remembered it. And, of course, there were the, the other half that did not. But Billy Graham, I remember Billy Graham passing away. Yeah, I remember once that. Once before. I remember him actually passing twice before. Okay. I, I remember resurfacing. There's a couple people where it's resurfaced like that. They've went, they've gone down a couple times. As crazy as that sounds, I mean yeah. that that's what we remember. Um, I want to throw a qu quick couple ones that are uh, a, a few people might be able to resonate, and then get back more into my like top ten, if you will. Yeah. But some a lot of people out here because they research NASA and whatnot. Uh, they'd be or even just from being a kid and going to school, they're familiar with things like it just <laughs> things like daylight savings time, Haley's comet. Halley's Comet doesn't exist anymore. Now, I'm not saying that anything NASA says is real anyways, but the whole Halley's Comet has now always been Halley's Comet with a short A, so it's H-A-L-L-E-Y now. And also, Daylight Savings Time has never existed in this reality, and it's Daylight Saving Time without an S on the end of saving, Daylight Saving Time. And we're supposedly crazy. And then a big one is somebody that's always talked about in the flat earth circles. Uh, many times, you people have even stared at this man's uh, gravestone on the ground, and that's Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun, you know the, you, you know the story behind him and, 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 and everything that goes along with that. Werner von Braun, his name has an H in it now. His first name is now Wern Her. Wern Her instead of Werner. Warren Her von Braun, and it's even changed on his tomb, and, and or whatever you call that, you know, where it says the thing about the firmament, the yep. palm, nineteen. It, it, that even the spelling has changed on that as well. And it's funny because I was showing people this, and you know, I asked them, hey, you know who this guy is, and I'll tell them, no, that's not him, because you can't tell them it's a Mandela effect because they'll just dismiss it. You have to lead people into the question, like, hey, fill out the finish this phrase, or you know what I mean. 
But all these people that had made memes with them all spelled it W E R N E R. And the memes is a great uh, thing I want to talk about too, because if you know um, how it is on Facebook, like you know the memes of Morpheus, for instance, from The Matrix. And everybody, I think it's probably like when I go to the meme making websites, one of the first default things they always show you, and ones I always see on Facebook, is Morpheus from that scene. And it says, What if I told you? The scene where he tells Neo, What if I told you, you know, everything you learned is a lie? And um, now, the thing is, everybody makes those memes. So you might say, What if I told you? And you'll fill in the bottom. What if I told you the earth isn't a spinning ball? Or what if I told you. You know, vax. You know, any any topic you want to make truth related, they're everywhere. Now that line has never existed. Not only is it's not just changed. Morpheus has never said, "What if I told you in the Matrix?" So what is with the millions of people making memes every time they pop up in my feed? No matter what the topic is, I reshare it and I put my own caption and I said, "What if I told you?" Morpheus never said, "What if I told you?" Yeah. People, people are like what? I'm like he's never said it. One dude yesterday, I mean, he went and went to go out and buy the movie to double check. I said, I'm telling you. The thing is about this is, is when you tell people about these Mandela effects, they'll tell you it's not true. Blah 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 blah. Just debunk me then. Just take one of the ones I'm telling you has changed. If you're saying it, it hasn't changed, then pull it off your shelf and just show us. That's like that. You know, when I bring up the Bible ones, and I'm not big in, into the Bible. I'm not a religious guy. I consider myself spiritual, but I'm not religious. But there's a, the Bibles have been changing crazily. Now, if you get into this topic, there's a few channels that they do a lot on the Bible changes. And, you know, there's a few that are, that are huge, like, you know, the lion and the lamb. Right. Isaiah 11, 6. Now, everybody knows it's the lion shall lay with the lamb. Right. But the thing is, now it's the wolf. And if you approach somebody that's very religious about this, it's it, it's it's often they'll just say, oh, they won't look at it because they'll tell you the word of God can't change. Now, here's my problem with that, and this isn't against anybody's belief, religion. You do what you do. I do what I do. That's cool. Whatever you believe the Bible to be, whether it's the word of God to you, the word of man, the word of whatever you want to believe, it's changed. <laughs> like, so – they won't even go pull it off the shelf to prove you wrong, though. I've got somebody to do this live on air, and it 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 obviously it changed to the wolf, you know. Yep. yep. These are incremental too, because they all seem to hit the King James version first, which for us I consider fortunate, because most flat earthers, which is who I'm trying to talk to the most, because I've been in that community a while, I'm trying to bridge the communities. Well, the version that they've been running around with the most, you know, not exclusively, but many of them. Their version is changing, and now it says the wolf. But not only does it says the wolf, listen up, guys. And I've heard this argument so many times in the religious flat earth versus globe earth type of discussions where, you know, the Bible gets brought up. The passages in the Bible, the 200 flat earth type related, you know, they don't all say flat earth, but about it being stationary and, you know, all the verses in the Bible about the flat earth, right? And they'll bring up to the, to the, the globies, if you will, that there's no planets in the Bible. Well, that's not true anymore. So planets are in the King James Bible. So either you guys were all lying, which I don't believe you were. Don't get me wrong. I believe you guys. It was not in there. But now that becomes a terrible argument because – and I brought this up to people, and I said planets aren't in the Bible. And then the, oh, I say planets are in the King James Bible. No, they're not, blah, blah, blah. Where? Kings 23.5. Everybody that's listening can look it up. Kings 23.5. Now we're used to say constellations, it says planets. So I'll tell these people, and this is where people backtrack. You just admitted to me planets was not in there. You based years of arguments on planets not being in there. Now when I tell you it's in there, they tell me it's a metaphor for constellations. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy, and it's like, no, you just it wasn't in there. I know it's constellations in all the other ones. Now, if you wait, it's going to eventually seep into the other Bibles, I believe. This is what happens. It, 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 they spread out. They hit the King James first because that's that one is only in the King James, but the lion and the lamb was, was changed to wolf in the King James, but now it's in every single version. Every single version, it's the wolf now, the wolf and the lamb, the wolf and the lamb. And one more big one on the Bible while we're at it is um, Act 530 now has Jesus hanging in a tree instead of being crucified. I would think that that's pretty big news to people. You know what they'll tell me? Well, a tree, a cross is made out of wood. Wood comes from a tree. So there it is. <laughs>
Yeah, they rationalize it. They, they go into uh, a great level of denial, Brian, and they have to rationalize it. It's because of what you said earlier on um, in the discussion. You know, people believe that reality is is set in concrete. Mm -hmm. You know, and the more that you do the type of work that you're doing and I'm doing and many others, you begin to realize that reality is not set in concrete, that it's fluid. Now, why it is and, and how it's fluid, uh, what goes on to make it that way, I don't know, to be honest with you. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, what are some of the reasons or thoughts or ideas about why things are changing for certain people, right? Not for everybody, obviously. Um, the, the other one I wanted to talk about, too, uh, I think it was your video, was Dr. J, Julius Irving. Yeah. Okay. Now, look, I'm from New York, New Jersey, and you know, and Julius Irving was, you know, he was big for us. Yeah. And his last name was I R V I N G Irving. Just like Kyrie Irving. Now he's much bigger than Kyrie, but everybody in the community again knows Kyrie Irving. And not yeah. cut one more thing. I don't mean to cut you off, but um, if you look at it, there are articles out there that say. Is Kyrie Irving the son of Julius Irving? Why would they even have those articles if his name's not even spelled the same? Right, right. Yeah, and I and I spoke to uh, my wife about it. I, I showed her. I said, "Look, I said, you know, Barry, take a look at uh, Julius Irving. Look him up." So she looked him up on the internet, and she's looking at his last name. She says, "E R." She says, "No, no, it was I R. You know, P I N G Irving." So, yeah, there are, thank God, other people that remember things as we remember them. Otherwise, we might wind up in, in an insane asylum. <laughs> Some people will say we belong there anyway, but no, we're, we're remembering things the way we remember them. Uh, I'm, I'm very clear about that. You know, I, I'm not one of those people, and uh, I know you're not either, that, you know, if we remember something, um, it's, it's very hard to backtrack from it because it's there. Now, there are some Mandela effects where I'm not sure because I didn't pay that much attention to certain things. Do you know what I'm saying? There's so many, Mike, that it's so encompassing over our whole reality. There are like tens of thousands of them. The ones that I don't, I'm not sure about, I don't talk about them on my show because I, right. I don't have the conviction. Right, right. You know, people will ask me, like, what do you think about this? And I have to admit, I said, you know what? I really, when it was around, whatever it might be, a commercial, a movie, whatever, I either didn't see the movie or I didn't pay much attention to the commercial, so I'm not going to comment on it. I'm not going to try to fabricate something or, you know, comment on something that I'm not familiar with. But for the ones that I'm familiar with, I stand by them. Like the other one is uh, Feel the Dreams with Kevin Costner. Um, that's going to be one of my next short videos that I do on, on my list. That's, you know, growing up in junior high and everything, we said that to everybody. If you build right. it, come. Right. The whole point of the movie, people say, oh, it was about his dad. If you build it, he will come. No, dude, his dad was secondary to that plot. Sorry, even though it's his dad, it was secondary to the plot. The plot was to mow the field to get the, the baseball players to come and then to get the crowd to come later. Exactly. They will come. Yeah, they will come. It wasn't he because the they was the baseball team that showed up, right? After yeah. he built He built the diamond in the field, so – yeah, that's another one. I'm trying to remember if there was anything else off the top of my head, and I don't want to eat into your time. But what else do you have for us? Because you have some great stuff. Yeah, we'll bounce around a little bit. But while you're talking about movies, I think movies are good because, you know, there's, there's people will try and say anything to not look into it. They'll say, oh, it's just little things. Then you'll tell them a big historical event like JFK. Or, oh, when you try and come at them, and we'll talk about anatomy and stuff later, but when you try and come at them with geography or anatomy, it's like people glaze over and they don't know those things. You come with musical movies. People resonate with it because they remember their favorite movies and their favorite music. Whether they're a good researcher or a crap researcher, they know their songs. They know their movie quotes. So that's what I like to come with to stop people off. How about in Silence of the Lambs when he says, hello, Clarice, he doesn't say that anymore. And he says, good morning. Yeah, it was hello. Yeah. And now if you if, if you look around and I, I – done this in a video i didn't do a short video but i covered it on a show the residue on that is crazy there there are tons of t-shirts on a amazon's a great place for residue ebay there's tons of t-shirts printed with that quote from the movie there's even an interview of him on letterman is his name anthony hopkins that's his name right yes there's an interview of him on letterman where not only does he say it 
Letterman says, what's that famous saying of yours from the movie? And he goes, hello, Clarice. <laughs> but now it's never in the movie. We're all crazy. So we're crazy. But And also, this guy's misremembering, the guy that said the quote. And that's where the move, the music ones take me because – Research and flat earth, like it's this big awakening thing for you, but sometimes it gets really stressful too because it's this whole mind-altering thing, right? So at the end of a long day of research, I used to look at the Mandela Effect music ones, like to kind of unwind and just kind of get a good – it, it was cool for me to do. And there's so many music ones that I want to talk about, um, and I'll, I'll just go through like four or five of the biggest ones. Okay. Cha we Are the Champions by Queen. Okay. Now, not only does – you know, not only do I know that the song ended with of the world, everybody I have ever talked to would end the song that way and knows it ends that way until they go into the denial mode, which we'll talk about after. Anytime, which is often, okay, you're from New York, I'm from Boston, been a lot of parades around our way for the sports teams. Right, that's right. I, every single time when there's a sports parade, City Hall Plaza, wherever you guys do it in New York, what do they sing? We, we are the champions. And how do they end it? Of the world. <laughs> Every time. In fact, if you heard them one time, not end it with of the world, you would be like, what the F? Like it'd, right. be, it'd be so anti-climatic, okay? Well, now, if you listen to Queen's album, and again, this was on every show. The Big Bang, you got Homer Simpson doing it on The Simpsons. Tons of TV shows. Everybody um, – What's that guy that does the carpool karaoke? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, James Corden James, or something. James Corden. There's a they Corden, do a yeah. carpool karaoke where they're singing it. Him, yeah. Stefani, George Clooney, and somebody else. They're all Mandela affected. So this is the thing. You guys can deny the Mandela effect, but you are all affected. And I'll get into why I think different people are affected a lot more than others. But with Queen, if you pull out your Queen album and play We Are the Champions – the last like five seconds, it just goes silent and fades out, and it doesn't say of the world anymore. It never has in this reality. So it doesn't matter how old your album is. And then, you know, speaking of how we all – so we are all inserting a line that doesn't belong there allegedly in unison and even singing it to the same pitch of the world. Everybody would even sing it like that, but it's never existed. And then you have Queen themselves. You have Freddie Mercury, the whole gang. At Wembley Stadium, I have two videos of them doing it live, singing of the world at the end. So I go and I show my buddy this because, you know, he's he's like four or five years older. He's really into the rock music. This would be something I would think he'd be like, oh, my God. And I show him. You know what he says to me? He says, you're just remembering when they did this that one time live. I said, buddy, this was in 1986 at Wembley Stadium. I was eight years old. I've never been to England. And we didn't have the internet. How would I be remembering this? Right, right. I remember it being played in every bar. All my uncles playing it in their car. The record players at my uncle's house. Every parade I've been to. I remember the, the album version, not the Wembley 1986 live version when I was eight, nine years old. I mean, that's just crazy. Yeah. Yep. That's how it was sung on all the albums. I have the vinyl and I also have the CD. Yep, and a couple of other, yeah, a, a couple other music ones, and then I want to get into a TV show, which is huge. Um, a couple other music ones, and I'll do them real quick. Save Your Soul by Jewel, who will save your soul. Now it's souls, plural, with an S. Who will save your souls. Still titled Who Will Save Your Soul, but every chorus says Who Will Save Your Souls. And I have a couple live performances of her, again, singing it the way we all remember, and then the one that I really like, which I think you might you might have seen the video. I just did a video on the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Did you see that one? I haven't seen it yet. I did post it, but I haven't watched it yet. All right. So the Red Hot Chili Peppers, they have a song called Under the Bridge. Yeah. Definitely one of their top songs, okay? Now, other people might even know it as the City of Angels. Is the city I live in, the city of angels. And the video is filmed in Los Angeles, in the streets of L.A. It's about L.A., and what is L.A.'s nickname? The City of Angels. Now that song, the music video, the album, the CD, the CD in your house, in your car, pull it out off your shelf, it will say the City of Angel, singular. And then the, almost every cover band that's done it says Angels. 
some interesting stuff is because with this, um, a little weird for me, but like uh, I used to play rock band a lot in Guitar Hero. Yeah. We used, we used to have people over get drunk and just wail away. <laughs> and on rock band, it would put the lyrics on the screen. Yeah. And I, I have it. I got an image of it, and it says City of Angels with an S right on the screen. And then again, to top it off, we have them live. I put them in my newest video in about six different shows that they did live singing City of Angels. And in two of them, one of them is Lollapalooza and one's Woodstock. So you can say however many people there. I'm not even going to guesstimate and you know try to make it sound like I'm trying to back my idea here. But there's easily tens of thousands of people there all singing along in unison City of Angels. So we're all just misremembering along with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, along with Queen, right? Right. Right. No, we're not. We're not, you know, and for people to just write it off, I understand because it's so mind boggling. It can't make sense. But again, it doesn't make sense because the rules you've been given and you've been given by people that are deceiving you about the reality we live in. And like you said, Mike, it's a it's fluid reality. I believe the same thing about time. These aren't linear things and they're changing. And sh me and you, sure, we, we'd be crazy if we told people we know what's causing these things or how these things work. And we have some ideas and, you know, we'll definitely get into that soon. But it's definitely happening. We can prove it's happening, you know? Another one that people know, uh, name changes real quick. Oh, no, I want to talk about this TV show before I forget. So it's a song and it's a TV show. And this one's huge. And it's, it, this one's probably haunting me more than anything right now. And that's Mr. Rogers. Do you know this one? Um Run it by me. I, I used, well, I'm very familiar with Mr. Rogers, but yeah, run it by me. Okay. So you know the intro to Mr. Rogers? Yes, I do. Yep. Could could do you mind singing? It's a wonderful. What did he say? It was a. It was. It's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Okay. Now, but now, he says it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. It was always a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Yes. Everybody I asked, not only that though, like when I'm at work. I'll be working and people around me will just start singing that song. If like, if they're in a good mood, everybody does it. It's a yeah. beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Well, now he comes in, he walks through the door. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. So no, that's not right. <laughs> it's not, not right. right. Now this, do you remember um, Eddie Murphy did Mr. Robinson's neighborhood on Saturday? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he comes through the door. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. There's a children's TV show called Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Every intro, it's a beautiful – they do the whole Mr. Rogers song. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. So I'm telling people this. This is an old one. This happened like two years ago. This is so huge for me. So we're telling people that it's changed to this. Everybody agrees it's done. You tell them it's changed to this, and it's like they just brush it off. Tom Hanks – who I'm going to get into, who's involved in many, he, he's involved in more Mandela effects than anybody I know. And he has all these strange connections to the Mandela effect and to CERN, which I don't believe is causing it, but some people do. Um, he has all these strange ties. So he's playing Mr. Rogers in the Mr. Rogers movie, Tom Hanks. They're making a Mr. Rogers uh, movie. It's coming out in a few months. First thing that happens on the set of the movie, sound engineer dies. Freak accident. Who's going to be the first person that's going to notice Mr. Rogers isn't saying a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and he's saying this, sound engineer, just keep that for a note. I don't know what happened. You know, some, <laughs> yep. you know what happened? He went out to smoke a cigarette and allegedly fell off a balcony. I'm not even kidding. That's the Is that right? I'm dead serious. <laughs> All right? So then I'm telling people about this, right? And the night this happened, I went live, and I did a whole show on it. Sony uh, CNN article comes up on my feed. Sony Pitches announces the name. Of the Mr. Rogers movie. It's going to be titled, it says in the CNN article, it's going to be titled after the intro, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, just like we remember and have always been saying. So Sony Pitches doesn't know and that they're doing it wrong. And then as it says, it says, as in the video below, and it puts the old intro on the video below, he comes through the door and he says this. Yeah. Totally disagrees with the headline. And people don't think there's nothing funny about that. And then I'm telling people, watch. When this comes out, he's going to come through the door, and he's going to say the, just like we always remember. Didn't even have to wait. They did this press conference with a chorus. They had like 40 people outside, and they were singing it, and it was real spooky. And they were like, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And I'm just like, 
It's so crazy, that one, to me. That one and Mira Mira. Everybody knows in Snow White, she said Mira Mira on the wall. Right. I haven't found anybody that remembers her saying Magic Mira. Nope. I found people that will go and find our residue, like books that were made after it, about it, and whatnot, that will say Mira Mira, and they'll say, here, see, you're just remembering this. No, no, no. You're back in my point. And second of all, I never read the book. I had the movie. I had the... The 1960s Disney cartoon classic on VHS that everybody our age probably had, along with 101 Dalmatians and, and, and all these other movies, right? That's what I had. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Yeah. That line has changed. Not just the mirror, mirror, which a lot of people miss. Now it says, magic mirror on the wall, who's the fairest one of all instead of of them all? The whole thing has completely changed. So we're telling people about this. And this is just like the Mr. Rogers one. This happened even before. Telling people, Mira, Mira. And they're like, yeah. So I go to my friend's house, same friend that I showed Wizard of Oz. I go to get a drink of Pepsi out of his cabinet. Burger King commemorative cup, Snow White. Mira, Mira on the wall has the whole verse right on the cup. Right. On, <laughs> there you go. Right on the cup. And then... In 2012, they made a movie. Julia Roberts is in it. Motion picture instead of animated of Snow White. They titled the movie Mira Mira. If it was never said, why would they title it that? They titled it that because that was the most iconic line from the movie. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, Brian, I want to step back for one second to make it clear to the audience that when we talked about the music, it's not a matter of changing the lyrics after a certain point. If you have the original vinyl or the tape or the CD, and you go back in time, that has changed also. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very key to this. Is It's not something where, okay, well, later on they edited the, the, the song, like in the case of We Are the Champions, and they decided that they were going to chop off and edit out of the world. Right. So exactly. if you go back and listen to your old records and your old CDs, you're going to see that. It's changed, and, and that's the very strange and weird part about this. So I just want to make that clear to everybody so that they didn't think we were talking about later releases of this music. Yeah. No, that's a very important point. That's what I try and tell people all the time, and we can elaborate on that. It's This isn't a digital release issue, a re-release. Um, I'm not saying go to a store and buy Star Wars. Or Wizard of Oz, and it's going to have these changes. And then you're going to say, people do say to me, oh, well, you know, Star Wars is the Blu-ray release, there's the 1999, yeah, and they're right, there's like six, seven, eight releases of the original trilogy of Star Wars. Right, right. Again, I'll say to you, pick whichever one you want. C-3PO is going to have a silver leg now. Dude, C-3PO was always all gold. Yep. Never had a silver leg. It's so ridiculous. I did a poll on Facebook, and I didn't use the word Mandela effect. I put two pictures of C-3PO, and I said, what do you remember? One of them was, was all gold, which is some of the residue I'll talk about. There's so much residue of that one, including Anthony Daniels, the actor himself, in all gold, in the costume, next to Mark Hamill, in his episode four outfit, next to friggin' uh, George Lucas. And there's a picture of all three of them, and he's got all gold on. Okay? It's, it's absolutely crazy, but... If you go and pull out your Star Wars now, C-3PO, even if you're not a big Star Wars fan, which a lot of people are, that's what drives me crazy. It's like, where are all these Star Wars fanatics? They should be going nuts over this. Well, I used to work in the movie theater when it first released back, what was it, 1976? 77. 70-something, 70 77. And um, it opened up. I was working in a movie theater on Long Island called the Fox Movie Theaters. And it played there for months on end, Brian. And I memorized every line. This is the first one that came out. And C-3PO was gold, period. Yeah. Didn't have a silver leg. I, I must have watched that film over and over and over again as an usher in that movie theater. And I, again, folks, it played for months on end there. They kept it there. So him showing up with a silver leg now, that, that's, that's not right. Mike, and it's like literally... And for a long time, I know things have topped it since maybe Titanic or whatever, but it was literally the biggest movie of all time for a yeah. while. And, and and I don't think anybody would disagree whether you're a fan of these types of movies or not. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. In fact, Star Wars is my favorite movie of all time. I've seen it hundreds of times. When I was little, like I said, I'm born in 77. When HBO hit, it was Star Wars all day, just like at your movie theater. 
once they were allowed to have it a couple years after the movie theater, it was Star Wars all, all day. It's all I watched, man. He was always all gold. Yeah. People yep. will say, oh, it was just reflecting off the, the desert and this and that. Dude, no. the first scene in the movie when Darth Vader comes aboard their ship and they're going to send R2 and C-3PO off the ship with the, with the plans from the princess down to meet Obi-Wan on Tatooine before they escape the ship and it's taking blasts. C-3PO and R2 are running through the hallways. The Silver Lake staring you right in the face now. The craziest time now is in the Return of the Jedi in the Ewok village when they hold him up in the chair in the chariot. All you see is the Silver Lake staring you in the face. Dude, he's never had the Silver Lake. And as we're showing people this, over the course of you know two years or a year, however long it's been with his leg, R2-D2 now has these big brown wires on his legs connecting his legs. He's never had those in my reality. Now C-3PO just got black gloves on his hands. They look almost like weightlifting gloves with the fingers cut off. He has yeah. them on the palms of his hands now. So these movies just keep changing. Chewbacca, now he's still a Wookiee, but now it has two E's. Wookiee with two E's at the end of it. There's just so many, and the ending for me has changed. In the ending, in my reality, where I come from, I'm just going to say one more thing about Star Wars and move on to another one. In the ending here, where I come from, in the original Star Wars, there's a uh, medal ceremony. And Chewie, Luke, and Han come up to like the, the podium, the stage, and Princess Leia is there. She kisses Han on the cheek, she puts a medal over his neck. She kisses Luke on the cheek, puts a medal over his neck. She doesn't kiss Chewie, but he's so tall, he has to bend way down. She puts it over his neck, he looks up and goes, mm, does the Chewie roar, and then it rolls to credits showing out of space. Now Chewie doesn't even get a medal. Okay, that, yeah. No, he that, got a medal. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That for me is huge. That for me is huge. Um, not to just jump all over the map, but I definitely want to talk about some geography changes. Yeah, go ahead. So for me, my, my number, I'm going to talk about, let's just get right down to it and talk about my number one and number two Mandela effects of all time. Okay, I'll start with my number two. And that is the South America and Panama Canal. Because if I ask anybody... You know, before they know what I'm, you know, asking about. If I say where is South America located, they're always going to say either underneath the underneath North America or underneath Mexico. And if you go and look at a map right now, and yes, people, again, this is people come. I put a geography video up. It's funny, Mike. You'll get a kick out of this. I put a geography video up about changes in the Mandela effect. I don't know if you saw it, but the the video got like fourteen thousand views, way better than anything I've ever done in like a week, right? And all the comments on there, people are coming on there telling me, you're just a stupid globey and maps are fake and you need a flat earth map and this and that. And I'm like, oh my God, dude. It, it has nothing to do with your map. It doesn't matter if it's a flat earth map or a globe. They, they, they missed the point. They're missing the point. The point is this change in our reality and these maps are representing that. And what I'm going to tell you about these map changes, you're probably listening and you're going to agree with what I'm saying about what I remember. But if you go back, Mike, like you were saying about the music, if you go back to your textbooks, you pull the atlas off your shelf, the encyclopedia, your school books, if you have them somehow from 30 years ago, you pull them out, the maps in those books are not going to be what we remember, and they're going to be exactly what I tell you they are now. They're going to reflect these changes that are wild. And those changes are the South America is now about 1,000 miles to the east over near Africa, and because of that shift, where Mexico would come and hit South America on the north side of it and the Panama Canal connecting the Atlantic and Pacific east and west, the, the tip of Mexico now hits the west side of South America because it's shifted so far over, the Panama Canal is generally north and south now. That is so huge for me, bro. The Panama Canal was always east and west where I come from. Yes, that's right. Huge. It's and South America was lined up right underneath Mexico. That's what I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just huge for me. And and it, you could go on geography about whatever, but if you look now, if you look at Cuba, Cuba is now – where I come from, Cuba was a tiny island, and it was south of Florida but a little bit off to the east as well. Now it's directly below it, and it's about the size of Florida. Cuba is yeah, the size no. of Florida now. That's wrong. Yep. It's crazy. The, the Italy, the, you know, I, I always looked at Italy as resembling like a standing boot, and now it's cocked back about 45 degrees like it's getting ready to kick a field goal, and it's like right up next against Sicily. It's, it's crazy to me. There's just so many geography changes, and 
the biggest Mandela effect for me I want to get into, and this relates to 9-11. So I want to – I know there's a lot of people out there. I don't know exactly who your audience is, but I tend to think out of every topic that people – you know, we all come from different roads. But if there was one topic that most researchers look into somewhat, it's 9-11. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yep. It's like a, it's, it's, it's the waking point for many people. Not everybody, as I found out by interviewing various people and their personal stories, not everybody comes through 9-11, but most people have researched 9-11. Now, I'm not going to put my 9-11 views right now because that's a whole other day, but I've done – 9-11 was, like I said, that's what I started with. For four or five years, that's all I did 24-7, hundreds of shows. I've seen every piece of footage you could imagine, all the video analysis, all the documentaries. And one thing they would always tell us on 9-11 – was that it was the second foreign attack on U.S. soil, and the first was Pearl Harbor. And I know some of you guys have heard this. Have you heard this? Yes. Yep. I've heard it often. Most most 9-11 documentaries would make that point, you know, and they would say it over and over and over again. Well, now that no longer remains true because there's an event that would now have to be the first terror attack on U.S. soil. And listen to this wild story, okay? This story is about Black Tom. When I ask people, hey, what do you think about Black Tom? Uh, I even titled my Black Tom video like, hey, 9-11 Truth is where are you at? What do you think about Black Tom? Nobody has a clue. They're like, who is Black Tom? It's not even a who. It's an event. But they're like, who the hell is Black Tom? I don't know who he is, right? And I'm just laugh, you know. And and I, I say these things these ways not to be confrontational but to plant a seed and make people, whoa, you know, like what is that? How do I not know about that? Well, Black Tom apparently in 1916 – Two German spies snuck in through New Jersey. They blew off explosives so big there was 100,000 pounds of TNT that blew up. It, it measured 5.5 on the Richter scale. It was felt in Philadelphia. It killed five people, and it sent shrapnel across the water, and it ended up hitting the Statue of Liberty, damaged it so bad that the torch has never been opened. Problem there is... Many people have been to that torch, and they're coming out speaking about it, not in droves, but there are people. I've spoken to a woman that has been to the torch, but in this reality, the torch has never been opened because it's been closed since 1916 because of this terror attack that nobody's heard of. Now, you probably know my opinion on these attacks. Now, whether you believe these attacks, you don't, it's irrelevant. It still wasn't in our timeline. It wasn't taught to us at school. No. Every year of school, you would have heard about this. and. Not only would I have heard about this through my 9-11 research and everybody else, too, that's seen all these documentaries, that would totally change the timeline. They wouldn't even – even if they didn't mention the event, they wouldn't tell you that Pearl Harbor was the first and 9-11 was the second because they'd be the second and the third, right? And even more than that when I talk about some other things, but the second and the third. But not only that, it was down the street from where 9-11 was, and it was the Statue of Liberty, supposed to be this symbol of freedom. And it was damaged in a terror attack. They're not going to rub that in our face all the time with 9-11. Are you kidding me? Yeah. That's interesting. I never heard of Black Tom. And uh, I mean, you just explained the whole story. My first thought was not only five people died. I clearly remember them saying that the torch was closed because um, there were structural issues because of the age of the statue. And they had to go in and reinforce the arm and, and the torch in order to be able to to use it again as a tourist attraction. That was it. Black Tom, and when you mentioned the name, Brian, I, you know, I, I thought to myself, I don't know what he's talking about. I'll just listen. Yeah, I, I got I got two videos on it. I made one. Now, for those that don't know, I'm sure people, you know, will check out the channel later. But I have, you know, all my videos are on one list that those are reality show. But I separate some of them into small lists. So I do like these 15, 20 minute Mandela effect videos on one effect. And it kind of – some people don't want to see a two- or three-hour show if they're, they're new to it, and that's understandable. Yeah. And my first one I did was Black Tom because it's the biggest one for me. Well, I did another one the other night because I came across a video, and it was one of these disinformation pieces. Like, you know, if you think the earth's flat, you're going to fall off the edge, and this is what these people believe, and it's just – it's not even true at all. And it, it comes out, and it's like, yeah, well, there's the – we're going to talk about this event that all of America seems to not remember. And I'm just like, oh, here we go, right? And then he goes and explains the event in detail, and then he, he gets into his explanation of why we don't remember. And he was like, oh, well, you know, it was Woodrow Wilson, and it was like this false flag type thing. So he just wanted to sweep it under the rug, and then it was erased from existence. And that was the end of the video, and I'm like, oh, well, 
There you go. <laughs> sure. There was a terror attack in New York that was felt in Philadelphia that damaged the Statue of Liberty, and he could just sweep it under the rug, and not a single person talks about it. Like, And then it t- ties into more than that, because for me, the statue, if you ask me, I don't know, you're from New York. Yeah. Yeah, where's the Statue of Liberty located for you? For me, it was always on Ellis Island. I had never heard. Yes, it's on Ellis Island. Exactly. Yeah. Ellis Island is, you know, that's where they used to process in the immigrants. Yeah, but now it's never been on Ellis Island, and it's on a totally separate island called Liberty Island. Now, people will say, oh, you were just confusing it with Ellis Island because the immigrants. No, no, no. First of all, I wasn't confusing it. Second of all, if if it's always been on Liberty Island, right? Is Liberty Island such a confusing name for the Statue of Liberty that we couldn't remember that it's on Liberty Island? Yeah, I mean, that's right. It's not like it's some Chinese name that we can't pronounce, so we just give it, you know, with the nearest island. If it's always been on Liberty Island, why wouldn't we say it's on Liberty Island? Why would we ever associate it with Ellis Island? So that is huge for me. That's my biggest one, and the Statue of Liberty itself, it keeps changing like the Thinker statue. Now if you look at the statue – her back right leg is stepping off the podium, it looks like. The angle from which she holds the book now is tilted down a little bit so you can see like the top part of the pages rather than just the face of the book. It's just a lot of crazy stuff going on with that. So that for me, that's my biggest one it is Black Tom, Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island. It's huge for me. Yeah, Black Tom is crazy. You said 5.5 on the Richter scale. I mean, that's not a minor event, right? No, no. And and then it gets crazy because basically Germany, I guess, has been kicking our butts up and down up and down the coast since 1916 because now in 1942, there's this event called Torpedo Alley where they sunk 5,000 ships of ours right off the coast of North Carolina, and they killed um, – no, 500 ships of ours, and they killed 5,000 people, including civilians. 5,000. That's bigger than allegedly what happened on 9-11. 5,000 people, including civilians, by Germany. And they bombed Oregon now, too. Why the hell would they even bomb Oregon? Like, I don't Now, is that a Mandela effect, Brian? Or do you think that's just uh, revisionist propaganda that they're floating out there? Well, apparently there's memorials and stuff down there that have been there now in our timeline. So I don't okay. think it's just – Stuff seeping into the into Wikipedia and the news outlets and whatnot. Just okay. like Black Tom, Black Tom definitely can't just be a story and story, obviously because it affected the statue and yeah, it, it's really really crazy. Um, even even other big movies too, like uh, everybody's seen Back to the Future. Oh yeah, Back to the Future, the famous scene in the beginning where he goes in and he plays the guitar after he boots up Doc's amp, the subwoofer, and he plays it and he blows back through the wall. Go look at it now. His electric guitar. Looks like a mini ukulele now. It's this little yellow thing about yay big. I'd have to go back and take a look at it. Yep. And the van that they show up, the terrorists in the beginning, yeah, it changed color. It used to be like a gray van. Now it's a blue Volkswagen van. Speaking of Volkswagen, I'm sure you know about the logo. No, go ahead. No, no, tell me about it. Well, the Volkswagen logo, the Ford logo, the Volvo logo, they've all changed retroactively too. Now they're all – the Volvo logo used to be like a circle with the Volvo in it. Now it has like that male or female arrow thing sticking up out of the right of it. I remember that one. That's right. Okay, yep. yep. And Ford has like this curly tip that comes off of the F now. The line – the bottom line of the F now has this curl that goes through the O. And again, it's always been there now. If you go and look on your own car, it's going to be there. So again – is there a Mandela burglar that comes around in the night, updates all your movies, goes out to your car, does body work in your car, switches <laughs> up your emblems for you? Or is something crazier than that happening here? Because they, they, the people that deny this, like you can deny this, but it's still affecting you. You still know C-3PO was all gold. You might not agree on all of these. Some of them you might not be familiar with, but everybody knows Ed McMahon worked for Publishers Clearinghouse. There's just yeah. – everybody's affected, so I don't think it's – um. Only certain people are affected. I think if you want to get into it a little bit, I think that what's happening is more of like a collective consciousness awakening. I also think, you know, possibly some things are being changed as like a sign from the creator. Like, listen, you know, this reality you're in is totally not what you believe. And he's changing some obvious things because for whatever this creator, he, she, it, whatever you believe it to be, a, a force, an energy, it can't directly communicate with us. So maybe it's changing some things. And, you know, I, I can't prove that right now. That's It's a theory. But, you know, 
theories are, are good when when you speculate as long as you state it as speculation and you talk in, in your circles and whatnot that's a good thing that's how you progress conversation i don't buy into the idea this is where it helps to research other topics like flat earth and whatnot and tie things together like there's a lot of people in the mandela effect community for instance that believe in all that nasa stuff right yep and there's a lot of people that believe that it's CERN causing the Mandela effect. And, you know, when I first started looking at Mandela late 2014, I looked a lot into these simulation theories and CERN causing it and all this. And and I would ask questions about, well, how are these D-wave computers, quantum computers manipulating our reality? The only answers I ever get is how many computations they can make per second and this and that. There is no real evidence. So, and if you know that NASA is a hoax and a money funneling organization, and all they do is practice pseudoscience and try and discredit God and all of this, you should be able to see that CERN is the same thing. For me, it's NASA underground. I'm not saying it might not have any purpose. Maybe they use it as like frequency weapons and whatnot, but they're not, they're not manipulating our reality, but they would love you to, of course, they would love you to think that they are. Think about it, because if there's a spiritual connection that we all have, a collective consciousness, and they can let you believe that it's this man-made science thing. It has an equation. These are the same people, Mike, that told us that they found the God particle. Right. And these are the same people that tell us they're going to recreate the Big Bang. Do you guys, anybody here believe the Big Bang? I hope not, right? So why are you going to believe this agency that says they're going to recreate the Big Bang and found the God particle and tells you that they, they don't tell you they're causing the Mandela effect, but they float it up enough out there to hint at it? And they love that people go on and on about that. That's why I think researching these different topics, because there's always a connection. And uh, the flat earth, 9-11 research, knowing the medical industry is a fraud, Mandela effect. These are all huge parts of this great awakening that we're going into. And I hate when people – dude, it's fine. Like I can't look into everything you look like. I've seen some of your Paul McCartney work and stuff. It's great, but I don't have the time to do the research you do on that. I'm over here doing this, this, and the right. other. But I would never, without looking at your research, say, oh, that's a PSYOP. But that's what people will do to me, whether it's Flat Earth is talking about my Mandela research, Mandela people talking about my Flat Earth research. I'll be talking about um, – you know, I'll be talking about Mandela effect. I was running like a Facebook watch party. Different people came in. This guy comes in. He's like, oh, I love your 9-11 work. It's brilliant, but you know, this Mandela effect or this Flat Earth retard stuff, it's like, well, dude, if you think I'm really credible in a deep research on two out of three major topics – why wouldn't you give me the time and day to at least take a week or a couple of days and look into what I'm saying about the third? Yeah, because it's cognitive dissonance, uh, Brian. I mean, I, I run up against this all the time. Now, I'll just touch on the, the McCartney conspiracy real quick. You know, I got into this and all I'm interested in doing is presenting my research. That's all I'm doing, you know. And the, the level of vitriol and just the denial that goes on with that one topic alone is mind-boggling, you know? So now I know that people who have investigated 9-11 have run up against the same thing. God knows people who have gotten into geocentrism and the flat earth, the same thing, geoengineering. You know, it's, it's the nature of the beast where people many times will cherry pick what it is that they want to be interested in. And they, they want everything to be in a nice little package with a nice little bow slapped on top of it, right? They want major portions of their reality to be true. They want it to be truthful. They, they want it to be set in concrete. They don't want to be told that just about everything, if not everything, is a deception and a lie. And when that thought starts to creep into their heads, uh, there's a small minority of people that will be free thinkers and critical thinkers and open up and say, okay, let me take a look at this also. But then you have a major portion of the population that even in the truth movement, they compartmentalize things. I will believe this or look into this, but I won't look at that. I'll believe this and won't look at that. And then of course we have the whole third category of folks that won't look at anything. I mean, they're just apathetic or unaware. Or don't and you know what they call themselves? It's ironic. That third group of folks, they call themselves the skeptics, but they're not skeptical of anything. No. No, no, no. <laughs> no, they just did like big sponges. They just absorb everything that's thrown at them, you know, by the matrix, right? So whatever's pumped into their living room through their television sets, they absorb it. And that's that becomes their reality. But I, I do agree with you that something is taking place that is 
changing the frequency across the board and trying to get more and more people to wake up because it's not just one thing. It's not just the Mandela effect, right? Because whatever's going on and whatever is behind it understands that it cannot be one singular event or uh, situation that's going to wake people up. It has to be full spectrum, multifaceted. So we have the Mandela effect. If that doesn't catch your interest, we have 9-11. We have the JFK assassination. We have geoengineering. We have vaccines. We have GMO, right? We have all of that stuff. For me, getting into the whole McCartney conspiracy, I've received so many emails from people saying, this was my wake-up call. Many people will say 9-11, right? 9-11 was a big one for me. But when I got into this, people are writing me saying, this is their 9-11. Now, I'm not sitting there to say this to pat myself on the back. What I'm saying is we have to have people like yourself, me, and others venturing off into various areas of research Yeah. because you have to have a portfolio of, of, of research in order to get the, uh, the masses or at least a critical mass of people to start paying attention and to understand that the reality that we're in is, is very wrong. It's very broken. I personally believe that what we're seeing is, is the reality that we used to be in is imploding. It's falling in on itself. And then from that, what will happen is you know, we're in a transition period. How long is the transition period? Could be hundreds of years. We're going to, once the smoke settles, we're going to be in a different reality. Um, my personal belief is a much better reality. So it's out with the old, in with the new. I believe better. And if you look at the changes from the Mandela effect, for the most part, I mean, I haven't seen anything that's been really harmful come from it. And for the most part, we've had beautiful changes in the world. All these, I haven't even talked about these, these places popping up with all these rainbow colors, rainbow mountains, yeah. rainbow lakes, these animals with all these rainbow patterns on it. People say, oh, you just don't know all the animals. And that's true. So I don't talk about the animals that much, but there's just so many creatures that are coming out that have never been around. If you go and look at places like uh, Fly Geyser or the Rainbow Mountains in China or how about have you guys ever heard of the Great Wall of Pakistan or the Great Wall of India? Now there's all these great huge huge monuments or whatever you would call those up. Uh, they'd be great wonders of the world that are just popping up that you've never heard of in your right. life. You know what I mean? I'm not. It's not some. I'm not asking you about some obscure thing here. No, it used to be the Great Wall. Uh, the Great Wall of China. That yeah. is what I learned in school. That I know. That was it. That was the only one I knew about. Um, yep. The Mandela effect too. Like you, I'm very on board with like what you're saying, and you know, I think what what is happening is there. It's be, our, I think our collective consciousness works on basically different frequencies. Okay, and I think what's happening is we are here. We aren't timeline jumping, and we aren't time traveling. And the reason I think is what I do is I I try to look at what I can dismiss based on what I believe. Now, if there's incremental changes. How can it be a timeline jump? Because if, say, we jump to a different timeline, that's why we see changes, me and you would have to see the same changes across the board. But even the most affected people don't agree on all of them. There are ones that we do disagree on, even ones we have memory of. So it tells me there's something else at play here. And if it was time travel and we went ba back in time so that changed everything going forward, we wouldn't have all this residue. Right. So I think it's a frequency thing, and I think – that when people are so have the cognitive the cog D so deep, they're operating at a different frequency than the rest of us. And the way that these things happen and permeate through us, they just not as many permeate through them. And they also permeate through people at different times. For instance, a very odd thing. Um, a friend of mine, Brian McFarlane, he has a Mandela channel. Okay, so I'll get back to him for a second. But I did a video on the C3PO, right? Uh, before I did a video on it. I was telling my friend about it online, about the silver leg. And he's like, I don't have the copy. I can't pull it out. He's like, can you pull yours out and show me? So I put the, put it in my media player. I played it on my screen. And I took a picture of myself in front of my laptop with the, with the C-3PO behind me. So I could show him, hey, this is my movie. He has the silver leg now. He didn't have black gloves in my picture. I noticed the black gloves like seven, eight months later. I go back. My picture has the black gloves. But not only that, my my friend who, you know, somebody I've done a lot of videos with, um, he did a video on the C-3PO black gloves like eight months prior. 
So it changed for him, but it hadn't changed for me. And I'm sitting here staring at C-3PO every day. It's not like for eight months I put C-3PO off to the side. I talk about C-3PO and Ed McMahon every day almost, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. So it, it is crazy, you know, and, and even um, going back to what we were saying, Brian, about the frequency and the shift in frequency, because I honestly believe that's what's taking place. Um, the whole world of politics and what's pumped into people's living rooms by, by the media is a, is a cartoon world now, right? It's very cartoonish. It's like, it's like we live in a comic book. And for me, that's another vehicle that's being used for everybody who sits in front of a television set and just watches that stuff incessantly. Now what's happening is what's coming into their living rooms is very cartoonish. So at some point, there are going to be, hopefully, a good number of people that are going to watch what they're watching and saying, this, this is absolutely nuts. This is crazy. This, why am I watching this? You see? In other words, they're making it so ridiculous that you, you would have to be brain dead not to at some point to open your eyes and wake up and start questioning things. That, that's what I think is taking place like with, with the whole the media aspect and politics. I mean, it really is a gigantic cartoon. Oh, it's, it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's absolutely mind boggling. Um, you know, when people say things like, um, well, it's just, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but they'll say, oh, it's just media and music. And then you'll give them big events. Oh, that doesn't, I, you just don't remember that. Well, how about when it's anatomy changes and your body is changing under your skin as you live your life? You know what I mean? Like, for instance, our rib cage has moved, our kidney. Now, in, in boxing, kidney punch is legal because it's very dangerous. Now your kidney has shifted, and it's up protected behind bone now, okay? Uh, your heart, you know, you say the Pledge of Allegiance, you always say it like this. Right, that's right. Because your heart's moved to the center, right? No, it's in the center. Now, yeah. This isn't a re-release of a book. This isn't disinformation by Google or some website. This isn't pamphlets being pumped out to your doctor and passed on to you. This is your own heart that you've always held over here. It's here now as you've been living your life. You weren't sleeping. Somebody put you under and came in and did surgery on you. The Mandela surgeon didn't come in at night and do a surgery on you and move your heart over. And then this goes into another theory of mine. We're talking about the, the consciousness is, okay, so we have all these changes, right? like say the movies, the music, all this stuff, even geography, but our memories remain, right? Our memories remain. Now let's talk about anatomy changes, but our memories remain. We remember this, we remember that, right? Our brain has even changed. There's been changes to the brain where there's these extra like lobe things on the side. Our brain has physically changed, but our memory remains. Makes me think, along with the other stuff we talked about, that our memory isn't actually physically stored in our brain. Now, people might away will, will scoff at me and say, well, what about people that damage their brain in a car accident? Well, what about this? What if our memory, if you picture this frequency we're talking about, the collective consciousness, what if that's like a frequency? So picture it. Picture it like a cloud. I'm not saying we're in a simulation. I don't believe that. Picture it like a cloud. And that's where our memory is stored rather than on the hard drive. And what if our physical brain is more like a receptor to connect to that? So if people do get in a car accident, they damage the receptor. They don't damage where the memory is actually stored in the cloud of collective consciousness, which is another reason why I think we can connect in our dream state and everything else. I, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I know you're right. Your brain is, David Icke explained this many years ago, is a biological computer. So if you're in a car accident and you damage your brain, what you've actually done is you, you have damaged the, the componentry. You've damaged the actual biological computer, right? Which could inhibit your ability to be able to, for the biological computer to be able to transmit and receive, you see? Yes. Science has not proven where your memories come from. They, they, they don't know. I mean, it's all theory. Yeah. So, so the probability that our collective consciousness or individual consciousness is stored in the ether, as an example, is, is something that it, I personally believe needs to be considered and, and researched and, uh, and, and taken a look at. I mean, uh, Tesla was all about the ether, right? He knew, knew, he knew all about how to, to, uh, to be able to, to tap into the ether uh, for frequency and, and for energy and, and so on. 
So um, I, I'm I'm with you on that. And um, so if if the if the frequency or the ether is changing or has is is being transformed, then what's going to happen is we're going to have different perceptions. We're going to we, we might have different memories, um, and, and so on. I know this gets into like some really deep stuff, and I know it's not the purpose of this show, but uh, you, I believe you're right on the money as far as memories, the mind, and the brain, because a lot of people too want to equate the mind to the brain, and they are not the same thing, right? So well, where, where I, yeah, where I come from is you know where I'm coming from. I should say is the brain is a biological computer, and it's operates that way, the same way as your laptop operates. But in order for it to do anything, it needs input. Where is the input coming from? Right? Absolutely. Right? So as an example, you and I are talking on Skype. We're using a computer in order to receive the, uh, in order to use the Skype software, which is communicating wirelessly, invisibly, Right for you and I to be able to have a signal and to be able to talk and to and to see each other, right? That's why a lot of companies they they use a lot of terminology which uh, maps to the true reality, the esoteric reality. So you you think about cloud computing, right? Yeah, cloud computing is a euphemism. So what they're doing is it in their own subtle way they are relaying back to us how our reality actually is constructed by applying names and nomenclature to their technology and how it works you see so anyway i i, I don't want to get like i said too deep into this but uh I, I like i said i think you're right on the money with it thank you i appreciate that and i just i actually if you're interested if you haven't seen it i just did a video specifically on that it's called do our does our memory reside in the cloud of collective consciousness you'll see it right on my channel okay, has, good has a green thumbnail i did like a 45 minute video and just real quick uh, another theory i want to touch on because it ties directly to that but i'll just go through it quick you know everybody's talked about chemtrails and stuff and that's one of the things you first get into when you get into even Taoist oh, yeah. type talk now for me you know i would think everybody listening to your show probably knows people like alex jones are a fraud and whatnot we don't really need to beat that dead horse now, do you really think that on day one, somebody like Alex Jones is going to come out and tell you the truth about chemtrails? Because he's one of the ones shouting that they're there to slow kill you. Now, hear me out. I'm not here to say that they're good for you. I think there's a much bigger agenda. Now, I know a lot of people in the Flat Earth community, and, and a lot of people scoffed at me in this in 2014, 2015, that I think you know it's to mask things in the sky, but also to maybe project on. But on top of that, with my other research into the Mandela effect, and this is, again, tying two topics together, three topics – my research to the Mandela effect and collective consciousness, I believe we're in a spiritual battle. Would you agree with that to a point? Yes. We're in a huge spiritual battle right now, okay? It's like mankind in the spiritual battle. And I believe one of the biggest things they're afraid of is uh, collective consciousness, us awakening on all these fronts, and us realizing our potential is key to them. They hate that. And if we, what they, I think what they're doing with chemtrails, it part, one of the agendas – is the metals that they're spraying in the air uh, impeding this frequency that we're on, interfering with it, making it harder to connect. Now, it's not working 100%. We're overcoming it, but I think they're trying to hold us back, and I think that's what's going on with these planes. Just a theory. No, it it's, could very well be. And um, I've also, Brian, have discussed that aspect too, that angle to it, is that uh, they could be spraying in order to interfere with those frequencies. and. Yeah, you know, the sun itself is is elect it is electromagnetic, right? It's not this big fiery ball in the sky, ninety three million miles away. So, when we take a look at what they do with the aerosol spraying program, it's always in front of the sun, right? They're always trying to block the sun. So, in my view, and again, it's a theory and it's a possibility. Is what they're doing is they're they're intentionally trying to interfere and block. Whatever it is, whatever electromagnetic frequencies are emanating from the sun that are helpful to us, that are beneficial to us and the rest of the world, right? Yeah, so, I, I think we have a, a consciousness connection to that sun possibly as well. Yes. As yeah, so what they're doing is they're injecting noise into the line. It's like a dirty signal. Exactly, man. 
this is what I've been saying. I mean, exactly what I've been saying. Yeah, yeah. Exactly what I believe. So I believe that that's very, very possible, you know, and it's very difficult, folks. I mean, we, we have to surmise and come up with our theories and think through this and philosophize because, uh, you know, they're not telling us. When I say they, I'm talking about the controllers. They're not, they're not coming clean on any of this stuff. No. So it's, it's up for us. It's up to us to be able to uh, try to figure out what the heck is going on. Can I talk about, like, trademark law and stuff real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, when the, the, we, we talk about, there's a lot of brands and, and products that have changed, like Fruit Loops is now spelled Fruit, uh, F-R-O-O-T. Yeah. Uh, Cap, Captain Crunch was never Captain, it's C-A-P apostrophe N. Uh, even the show Different Strokes is like that. Uh, different, doesn't say different now, it has an apostrophe instead of like um, two, instead of two of the letters. We see this a lot with the apostrophe, which I'll get into after the, the logos, but you know, there's resources. You guys will say, oh, companies can change their names and, you know, but there's, we can, we look into this. We don't just come out. Like, we're not stupid enough where a company is going to change his name. After I've been doing research for nine years on different things, I'm not going to come out and tell you that this is a Mandela effect when you can just go look it up and say, no, they just changed their label. Like, I'm not an idiot. And there's sites like Logopedia and other places where you can check this. And another place, so Goldmine, is like the U.S. Trademark Office. They'll have trademarks and patents for the names that we always remember that never existed. I mean, it's littered with it, dude, littered. And one of them that's key, and a lot of people in the flat earth community might know how these types of things work. Like when you build a website, Mike, you know what, like a who, who is domain? You can go in and you can see when somebody registered a website. Yeah. Okay. Warner Brothers, who owns Looney Tunes. Looney Tunes, based on Looney Tunes, the cartoons, right? T-O-O-N-S is now T-U-N-E-S, like a musical tune instead of a cartoon. Makes absolutely no sense. Was always tunes for me. On top of that, Tiny Tunes, which is not only the same world, it's the same characters. Like when they're younger, Tiny Tunes is T O O N S. Why would it be still? Why would it be named T O O N S based off of a T U N E S, right? And I know it's T O O N S. It always was for me. If you go and look at the registry domain, when they registered the Looney Looney Tunes website, they registered LooneyTunes.com with a T-O-O-N-S, two years before the T-U-N-E-S. Dude, you don't register the wrong name of your website two years later, put the correct one. It goes the other way around. You register my website, for anybody that wants to know, and I'll plug it later, therealnewsonline.com. I get offers for therealnewsonline.net, this and that, and the other thing for like $2 a year. It doesn't work the other way around. You register what your website is right away. They actually registered T-O-O-N-S. You guys can still go look at this. The residue is still there. Um, some other things too, because I know I know we're getting down to like crunch time, maybe a half hour left or so. Yeah. Um, some, some really big government agencies that people would know, like the DEA, everybody. And I don't know if you know this one, Mike. Do you know this one already? No, go ahead. Well, what would you say the DEA stands for? It's the Drug Enforcement Agency. Well, you're wrong. You are just misremembering, Mike. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you are participating with Brian, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Tom Hanks running a PSYOP on America. <laughs> it's, it's, now it's the Drug Enforcement Administration. It always has been in this reality. Another one, speaking of science and, and some of the topics we look into, you guys know evolution is a fraud, I would think. A lot of people here. And if you don't, that's cool. But you would know a lot of things in museums are frauds. Right, right. What is the main culprit? What is the main museum that we speak of in the United States where these artifacts are held? The Smithsonian. What's the full name? Two I words. Just, what's that? Two words. Do you know the second part of the name? I just used to call it the Smithsonian. Well, it was always the Smithsonian Institute. Yes, okay, yeah. Oh, it was to me. The Smithsonian Institute. Now it's always been the Smithsonian Institution. And I'll just blow through some other ones. Real yeah, that, isn't that crazy? The Smithsonian. That is crazy. Yep. Yep. How about in New York? Now, again, New York, Grand Central Station has now always been Grand Central Terminal for the last hundred years. Oh, no, 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 no. Yes. And if you go back, it was only Grand Central Station in like 1902 to like 1906. And now it's always been Grand Central Terminal. Mike, I mean, there's so much residue. And you're from New York. You want to talk about that? I mean, you've been there, I'm sure. No, I mean, we've always called it Grand Central Station. And, uh, you know, I worked in New York, Brian. I was in and out, you know, business trips back as late as 2014. And I would wind up, wind up going down to Grand uh, Central Station in order to take a train to go someplace. And... Uh, uh, if I had to go, you know, go 
to a, a, a client meeting or whatever it may be. And the interesting thing is, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking when I had conversations with, with colleagues, we all called it Grand Central Station. You, you see? So the, the, the real people interacting and going there, that's what we refer to it by. Yeah, it's just crazy. Even even the tourists refer to it by that. Even everybody yeah. refers to it. Everybody knows it is. It's dude. It's so famous. It's it's the Grand Central Station. Of course. News. I mean, it's one of the most famous. Even people, as crazy as it sounds, people go there for a tourist attraction, even if they're not taking the train. Like, who the hell goes to a sub uh, a train station just to go check it out? People go there. What do they call it now? Grand Central Terminal, and they tell us that Grand Central Station has always been the subway, and we're confusing it. Yeah. No. 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 Um, some name changes I want to blow through real quick. Uh, people's name changes. So people say, oh, people can change that name. You go back and you won't find these names have changed. Sally Fields is now Sally Field. Always has been in this reality. But the biggest name change for me, and this is in my top 10. It's the only name change in my top 10. You know, when I grew up, there were two characters you wanted to be. You either wanted to be Superman or Luke Skywalker. I'm going to tell you right now. Both of those actors' names have changed. When I grew up, Superman was played by Christopher Reeves. Now, it's Christopher Reeve with no S. My own Superman movies I pulled out, and the, he's not on the credits as Christopher Reeves. He's on as Reeve. And if you remember Superman when it came out, that was like when they first started using like CGI animation for the title screen. Had yeah. these big like Roman numeral style numbers, like big block numbers with the credits coming on the screen with that iconic dun, 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 dun. The credits of that movie were a big deal. It said Reeves. Now it doesn't. And if you go back to look for Residue, you know this show uh, Pawn Stars? Yeah. Somebody that was a collector in like Hollywood or whatever had – Christopher Reeves' actual Superman costume that he wore to film the movie. So they brought it there to get X however many thousands of dollars for it. So the Pawn Star guy's like, I got to bring in an expert to verify this. Brings in his guy. They obviously cut the video. He came back the next day, whenever it was. They, they show his guy, comes in, he verifies it. He's like, oh, these things, they have this certain tag. So he looks at the tag on the inside that's from the Hollywood lot. It's embroidered with his name, Christopher Reeves. From whatever movie company that is that gave him the costume, I, I, it was a universe, whatever it is, Christopher Reeves right on it. Now, Eminem, who everybody knows now, maybe they didn't before, he's a huge, famous rapper. Um, whether you like him or not, doesn't matter. Whether you like that type of music or not, doesn't matter. Eminem started his career by attacking his mother and Christopher Reeves. This is a video I have. Somebody else made it. Uh, I think his name is not from this timeline as his YouTube channel. Um, every time I, pl I play it, I plug his channel. He made this great compilation of all these Eminem songs where he's talking about Christopher Reeves. There's over like 50 tracks condensed in a four-minute clip. Now, it, I can't play it for you now. It's very vulgar, and I know you don't want to do that, but if you want to check it out later, I'll send it to you. And it's just clip uh, – Christopher Reeves, Reeves, Reeves. Everything is Reeves over and over and over. He built his career attacking this guy. We talked about Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker. Mark Hamill now has two L's on his name. It was always Hamill with one L. Sip, oh, yeah. yeah, one L, dude. Iconic, one L. Now it's two. Sybil Shepherd now has two L's instead of one. Wow, okay. See, I didn't know this. Yeah, hey, right. She had one L in her name, Sybil Shepherd. Yep. A lot of people in like the flat earth circles or other circles where there's a lot of like, uh, there'll be like people talking about people that are fake prophets and stuff like preachers like Joel Olstein. Joel Olstein, Joel Olstein never existed now. He lost his L. Now it's Joel Osteen, not Olstein. Joel Osteen is his name. And then one that just hit me, I'll do a couple new ones. Like we talked about Julius Irving. You've seen my sports video, I assume. Did you see the Dwayne Wade one on there as well? No, no. So if you guys know the bat, do you know the basketball star Dwayne Wade? Yep. Well, Dwayne Wade, and Dwayne is spelled like Dwayne would be, D before the word Wayne, Dwayne. Now the Y has moved, and it's after the W, so it's D-Y, I mean D-W-Y-A-N-E. It's like Dwayne. <laughs> His name is Dwayne. And then another one for me that was huge, I just did a video on it, is Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning. When I grew up, besides the Macho Man and Hulk Hogan, Mr. Perfect was my favorite wrestler, and his name was Kurt Henning. His name is Kurt Henning now. He dropped the N. It's Kurt Henning. This just – dude – I have done this – every show I do, there's just so many movie movie changes. Uh, Macaulay Culkin from Home Alone 
Yeah. Dropped a. his A is gone from his last name. Now he's Macaulay Culkin. Culk, not Culk. Macaulay Culkin. Um, even Gandhi for me. Gandhi, you know the the Indian Gandhi. Yeah. G A G H A N D I. The H has moved for me, and now it's after the D. So it's G A N D H I is Gandhi. Okay. Yeah. And I know a lot of people. We'll say, oh, I'm not sure about the name ones. That's why I don't, you know, focus on the name ones as much. Only one of them's, like, in my top ten. But I, I know these have changed. And then the English language has changed. The biggest word for me that's changed is the word dilemma. And there's a reason I want to talk about it, too. The word dilemma for me was D-I-L-E-M-N-A. And for almost everybody I ask, now it's always been D-I-L-E-M-M-A. Now, let me ask you this. If there was no N in dilemma, so you're going to tell me, we're all misremembering the same word. We're all inserting the same wrong letter in a word that didn't, never existed in that word at all, right? We're going to insert the same wrong letter that happens to be a silent N in a word that doesn't belong in unison with all these people? I mean, how does that even make sense? We're not talking about dropping an S, adding an S, which is still big to me. Any change is big. We're talking about adding a silent N in the middle of a word that doesn't allegedly belong like how would that even happen yeah I mean, the, the odds of even two people doing that would be <laughs> yeah i i seem perplexed here brian you know because you're you're saying um you're giving these examples and some of them i'm familiar with and others i'm not and as you're going through some of the ones that i'm not i'm, I'm remembering them like you remembered them you know so uh it, it's really really uh amazing and perplexing at the same time and one of the questions i wanted to ask ask you is do you get leads to to, uh, to look at this stuff, or is this stuff that you're discovering on your own? I'm assuming it's both. It's it's both. Um, I'm always researching into this, but to be honest, like there's so many of us putting out Mandela videos now. We all kind of share off each other. Uh, most of my Mandela effects, though, I try not to get from other people's videos. If there's a really big one, you know, I'll I'll use it. Uh, oh, let me talk about the George Bush assassination attempt before I forget. But I got that from somebody else's video. But usually. I get them from friends of mine in the community. We send each other stuff. Yeah. I got friends that are really good researchers. We stay in little couple group chats where five or six of us will just share stuff, whatever at will. And um, there's a lot of places, uh, you know, YouTube's really good to look for it. Uh, Reddit has a lot of it. You can look around. And dude, I just, I, I can't, I can't go through a day without seeing a change. Like I, I literally, and I don't watch TV, but like people in my house do. If I walk by the TV, first commercial I see, there'll, there'll be a change. Like, I mean, everybody's had stove and stovetop stuffing. Yep. It's never existed now. It's always been craft. And there is no company change. Craft didn't buy stofers. Stofers as a company still exist. But if you look at a box of stove and stovetop stuffing now, it says craft where it said stofers. It's never existed. And apostrophes are popping up everywhere. So, for instance, let me start with one that has to do with the English language. Have you ever heard of the movie um, um, Bridget Jones's Diary? I've heard of it. I've never seen it. Yeah. Okay. If you look at that movie and others that are similar now and books. So if you were going to write Bridget Jones's diary as in her diary in the possessive, I would write J-O-N-E-S and put an apostrophe after the S. Jones's. Now it is proper English to put an extra S. So Bridget Jones's diary, or if you were to say this phrase, keeping up with the Joneses, you would put J-O-N-E-S apostrophe S. Think about that. And even even if you Google it and look at it, it's so ridiculous. And these apostrophes now are popping up in all different names. Everybody in Flat Earth knows Chappelle, Dave Chappelle, because uh, he seems to be kind of a truth or he disappeared to Africa. We all know Dave Chappelle, a lot of people. Dave Chappelle is awesome. He's funny, right? What was the name of his show? What was it? It was the Dave Chappelle show, right? It was the Chappelle show. Yeah, yeah. Now it's Chappelle's show with an apostrophe S. That's not what it was. Also, uh, Coles, K-O-H-L-S, now has an apostrophe in it. Lowe's has an apostrophe in it. How about Jack Daniels? If you pick up a bottle of Jack Daniels now, it's Jack. It's not Jack like his name is Jack Daniels. It's like his name is – it belongs to the guy named Jack Daniel. It's Daniel apostrophe S on a bottle of Jack Daniels. If I don't know if you drink or if you have a T-shirt, you can pull – Hell yeah. Jack, Jack Daniels, Johnny Walker Whiskey is Johnny with an I-E now, not Johnny with a Y. Johnny Walker Whiskey with an I-E. 
Mad Dog 2020, which I used to drink all the time as a kid, has never been called Mad Dog 2020, and it's actually Mogan David 2020. That's what the MD stands for, Mogan David, not Mad Dog. Yeah, that's that's this is crazy shit. I, I you know, with the apostrophe at the end of the name, like my last name is Williams. And if if you, you wanted to say put apostrophe S. No, you right? you right. It would just say Williams with an apostrophe, right? And there wouldn't be an S after the apostrophe. Now it's appropriate English. And when these things change in the English language, you'll notice uh sometimes like for a little bit the the autocorrect will take a little bit to catch up. And then all of a sudden it'll correct you. Like now, if you put the lemon with an N, it'll right underline it. It won't let you do it. It'll be, it, it's a double M. But like when it first changed, like it might let it slide for like a month after the change. It's really, really crazy. Another one for me that changed is the word cemetery. Cemetery now no longer has an A in it. Now it's three E's. C E M E T E R Y. No. That's Harry. There's no A in cemetery. Look it up. No A, guys, in Cemetery. For me, it was two E's and an A, which is a patent I have picked up on a lot of words. Now have two E that were, were three, now were two E's and an A. Now have three E's. The word independence for me had an A. It was two E's and an A. Now it's three E's. And there is residue where the White House has tweeted out on 4th of July, Happy Independence Day with an A. The U.S. Air Force. Now, these are people that if anybody should know how to spell Independence Day on the 4th of July before you tweet it out would be the White House and the Air Force. And when they did this, one of these articles came out, Mike, about America misremembering. <laughs> you know, what? so we got the 9-11 articles, never forget. Now <laughs> Mandela articles, America misremembering. And it talks about how could the First Lady, how could the Air Force, how could the Boston police, all these people tweeted out independence. And then a couple of them, like the First Lady, she removed it hours later because all, all the people were telling her all whatever, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. Twitter is a great place for um, when phrases and words change or lyrics uh, the other day, Rodney, Ke Rodney King's speech changed after the L.A. riots when Rodney King got in front of the microphone. And if you look, you can find T-shirts of this. You'll find parodies of it, tons of memes. If you go to Google Images and see quotes that have changed, you'll see memes that millions of people made. He used to say, why can't we all just get along? Exactly. Yep, that's what he said. Now, if you watch the video, I did a video on this the other night along with the George Bush. It's in the same video. He now says, can we just get along? He doesn't no, say no. Can we can we just get along? Yeah. And what do you remember about the G.W. Bush assassination attempt? <laughs> nothing. I'm going to reckon probably nothing, right? It's probably news to you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's absolutely news to me. George Senior. No, no, Senior. Junior. Nine Eleven George. Oh, nine eleven George. Um, I have no recollection of any assassination attempt on him. No, a lot a lot of people hated him, but you have no recollection of an assassination. No, I know. You know, a lot of people might have said they wanted to, but never, never heard anything that would be considered credible enough to even see it on the news. No, no. Okay. So now wait till you hear this wild story. This is like a black Tom story. Everybody knows, and I showed it in my video, they all they remember about aggression towards Bush physically is people throwing the shoe at him. Remember that? The reporter throwing the shoe at him? Yeah, I remember that. Famous incident. Oh, but his assassination attempt. So allegedly when he was in Georgia, the nation of Georgia, he was in Georgia with the president or whatever the guy that's the head of the country there is called, premier, president, I don't know, I'm not going to pretend to. They're on a podium, and there was supposedly a guy with a Soviet-made hand grenade, right, that had it wrapped in a red handkerchief. He, threw, he pulled the pin. It was a live grenade. He threw it towards the podium. It landed 60 meters from the podium, 60 feet from the podium. It was cushioned by the fact that it hit a girl. It didn't explode because the handkerchief was wrapped so tightly around the lever. And at the time, Bush wasn't aware of this, but it, we were aware of it later, right? And then, supposedly, it gets even crazier. Months later, when they went to pursue this guy, I guess the FBI and whoever else went down to Georgia to investigate, took over the investigation, as you know that they would, right? They go down there. And apparently there was this ensuing firefight that the suspect got in, and he ended up murdering the head of the counterintelligence unit for the nation of Georgia. The guy that attempted to kill G.W. Bush. I have never heard an inkling of that story. No. 2005, by the way, for anybody that no. – No, 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 yeah. Ne never once. And again, this is before 9-11, not before 9-11, but before I came into the research of 9-11. Yeah. 
how did I never once ever in any circle that I was in, any forum, people that hate George Bush, how did nobody say, oh, I wish that guy would have got him with the grenade? There would be memes about it, jokes about it. They'd be doing parodies about the grenade thrown at Bush, how we wish it would have went off. Come on, we would have heard about this. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's just a crazy story to begin with. It, it's so crazy that it, it would have made headlines, right? Yeah. And, and you know. Like a good James Bond movie. I talk often about these assassinations or assassination attempts keep changing. The Reagan one for different is me now. Reagan, I remember like two shots from Hinckley. Now there were six shots fired in rapid succession. You got to see the video. It's <laughs> the first five missed. The other guy still hit that got hit, his aide or whatever. The first, you know, but they missed the target. Five missed the president. The sixth shot supposedly ricochets off a bulletproof car and then bounces and hits the president. Okay, yeah, no, it didn't happen that way. I don't remember it that way at all. One bullet hit uh, James Brady. Yep. Right? Hit the president. And hit the president. That's what I remember. I remember two. I'm not going to say there wasn't three, but I remember two. There wasn't six. And it's it sounds even faster than you could pull the trigger on, on a handgun. Like it's Yeah, it wasn't rapid fire. I remember maybe two or three shots uh, because as soon as the shots went off, Right, the Secret Service just converged on the whole scene, and he got hit under the rib cage. Right, that's what I remember. I thought it was, uh, yeah, I thought it was like over here somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it, and it got Reagan in the car real quick. But I, I, the point being here is, you know, I, I was uh, obviously watching that on television when it came out. So yeah, I mean, maybe two or three shots, but I don't remember rapid fire, five or six shots, not at all. Oh, and it's it's all these assassinations to me, and the and the JFK one, you know, we talked about earlier. That's you know was a big point for me. You know, it, for me, it's changed again. It keeps changing. Um, now, I know that when when I first looked at JFK, the Zapruder film was in black and white, and I know that they colorized it or whatever. Dude, literally, the Zapruder film has always been in color in this reality. Yes. They say that now Zapruda shot it with an 8 millimeter hand camera that was color in 1963, and I remember it being black and white originally. I don't remember it being in color originally. No, no. And, and the thing, too, going back to the Kennedy assassination, I meant to, uh, to mention this before, Brian. Um, I had Max Egan on the show going back a while ago. Maybe it's been about two years now that Max was on, and we talked a little bit about the Mandela effect, and Max said to me, he talked about, six people in the car versus four. And he says, Mike, I remember four. He says, because he had done so much research into the JFK assassination. You know, so his recall was based upon the fact that he was so invested in in, in researching it, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I remember four as well in the car, just to reiterate what we talked about before. And you guys all remember the different theories. And one of the most popular theories was that the driver did it. Okay. Right. That's right. And, and that it was based, and you couldn't see a gun, but that was based on what footage, Mike? It was based on this, him reaching back with that right hand. Right. And it, like he might have fired the shot. He can't even reach back with that right hand now because of the extra windshield in the way this – and, and, and that he doesn't reach back at all. And again, let's not just talk about the six people in the car, Mike, like we did versus four. We're talking about the president being assassinated in the car where we don't remember the seats. But we're also talking about the president now allegedly assassinated in a car that is so odd it has two windshields. When do you ever even see a car with two windshields? I'm not saying they don't exist, but when do you actually ever see a car with two windshields? So you're telling me JFK got shot in a car that had two windshields, but we don't remember that? Right. That's that's pure pure nonsense, brother. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll tell you what, Brian, you've, you've had uh, some great, great examples. Um, some of them I knew about, others uh, – you're going to make me go look now. <laughs> and uh, what you should do is send me a number of links uh, to shows you've done. I mean, obviously, I'll put the link to your YouTube channel. But if, if there are specific shows uh, and analysis that you did that you would like the audience to, to hone in on, just send those links to me, and I'll make sure I put them in the description box. All right, cool. Yeah, there are definitely a few. Like, there's some we didn't really get into that much. Like, I talked about the rainbow changes in the world. But yeah. it's easier if I show. So maybe I could give you a link to a video like that. Hey, look at these landmarks he's talking about. Like, look at this amazing stuff that's going on here. And, and then there's, yeah, the different videos for different things. That would be awesome. I'll give you a few links. And 
in the description if you can just put the couple links to my couple channels because I got to Absolutely. Buy. Yeah, I'll put anything you want me to put in the description box that points back to your work. I'll put that in there. Well, Brian, I just want to say uh, it's been a, a great, great conversation. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we hooked up. And you can come back anytime. Anytime, you know, you want to talk about something, the Mandela effect. I know we thought we might be able to touch on the flat earth in this discussion, but we really weren't able to. So maybe we can come back and do a show on that or anything else that yeah, man. we can talk I, about. I would love to do a, a, a show on just flat earth because I have, I have some theories on that too uh, that differ a lot than the community, just like on the sun, the moon, and just all sorts yeah. of things. So I can elaborate on that as much as I can, the Mandela effect, you know, but I just want, I'm glad that we kind of, Ham at home this one because I don't feel that there's really too many good uh, interviews floating out there for the people trying to pick up on what the Mandela effect is. And so I'm, I'm really glad you asked me. Can I ask you a question? How did you come across my Mandela work? Was it because I was on Patricia's show or was it something else? Actually, a good friend of mine on Facebook, Amanda, um, she had um, put a video up on her channel and uh, she had. Uh, given a uh, a list of YouTube channels and people doing alternative research that she found to be you know, very good and very credible. And um, she had your YouTube channel as one of those eight to 10 channels that she said that people should go take a look at. And that's how I found your work. And, um, and I started looking at it and started putting a lot of your material up, posting it up onto my blog. Uh, because you, you do great work. Uh, you know, a lot of this Mandela stuff is kind of like, uh, it's almost like gee whiz, National Enquirer type of stuff, you know, and it's, and some of it is very dicey and sketchy. And I found that with your work, you, I mean, you didn't do that. I mean, you, it was very detail oriented and you were very articulate with the way that you presented it. And I said, okay, so uh, I got very interested in, in your work. Awesome. Awesome. How's the feedback been when you've posted my stuff? Uh, very good. Very good. It goes out to my blog. The blog does about 30,000 uh, views a month. And uh, I also, it goes out into Twitter land and uh, also onto my Facebook page. I also have a Sage of Quay Facebook page. It has around 1,200 followers or so. So, uh, you know, so the exposure is there. It's thank definitely there. I appreciate you posting it up and thank you. So you've seen, you've seen several videos. Yeah. So yep. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. Do great work. And just uh, let me just tell the people real quick again uh, to people when you do click on the links and go to my channel on my main channel, the Brian S. Stavely channel, um, you will see a Mandela Effect shortlist that if, you, if you're just trying to get into it and you want to look for a specific one, like, oh, I don't agree with that, I don't agree with that, but I know Ed McMahon or I know Mara Mara, watch my Mara Mara video, watch my Ed McMahon video, 15, 20 minutes, and you, you, it'll be really laid on you real thick with just one of them, and you'll be like, oh, then go to another one that resonates. But all my shows are on the Dose of Reality list, and every Saturday, pretty much, I do a show with Paul Knight. We talk about Flat Earth, Mandela Effect, Consciousness, Crystals all sorts of stuff. And it tends to be, I do a video almost every day now. Some are short, some are two, three hours, you know, I just talk about whatever. So thank you. I really appreciate coming on. And I, anytime that somebody has an open, dude, I, I'm so glad that today you told me that you had a personal effect with the Kirk Douglas one, because that changes the whole gear of the way I have to present this on your show. I don't have to come on here and convince you. No, you don't have to convince me. Yeah, it's real. I mean, it's, for me, it's real, real, real. And I know other people that um, the Kirk Douglas Mandela effect is uh, very real to them as well. And these are credible people. These are not, you know, kooky folks. These are people that are good people, good, smart people. And that's what they recall. That's, a, that's what they remember, you know. So, all right, Brian. So, you know, again, thank you so much. And uh, I'll have the show out pretty quickly because uh, we're going to do the, the video bit here. And, uh, cool. right, so I won't have to go back and edit the audio and stuff like that. So again, thank you so much. Yeah, can and, you me as soon as it's up? I mean, I'm yeah. subscribed and I, I'm belled and everything on your channel, but just in case, can you message me when it's Absolutely. up? Absolutely, I'll, I'll send you the link as soon as it's up. All right, awesome, man. Thanks again, and um, you know, I just, I really appreciate the opportunity to be trying to talk to different communities and try and bridge topics. That's what I'm all about, trying to get people to research more than one topic. You don't gotta believe what I gotta believe, people. You don't gotta believe what I believe, people, but you gotta believe that what you're being presented on so many different fronts is bull crap, including the way our reality works and Absolutely. how your senses and how your senses supposedly betray you because you should trust your senses. God gave them to you for a reason. That's you it. You got that right, brother.
All right, All right Brian. You have a great day, and uh, I'll uh, I'll see you on Facebook, and I'll get the link out to you as soon as I can. All right, Mike. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye. And that concludes another Sage Akwe interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the description box below. And as always, I would like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can find all my social media and web links by visiting my hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to check out my music and album releases. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone with the next show. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.